Howdy, it's Tubal Kane again, and this time with number 25 of my What Makes It Work series, and this time to tell you about what makes a Jacob Chuck works. You've all used these Jacob Chucks most of your life if you're a machinist. What is it uh, that's inside of them that makes it work? Now be sure and go back and look at my 24 other What Makes It Work videos that are languishing on YouTube. Well, let's go over to the bench and take one of these apart. You may have watched one of my recent videos, tips number 385, where I tell how to renew a Jacobs drill chuck. And in that video, I show how to install the uh, repair parts in a chuck. And to some extent, there'll be some similarities between this video and tips 385. But go back and look at that other one if you have not already. Now, in the Jacobs catalog, these are referred to as plain bearing chucks. They are the less expensive models, although they're still not cheap. These are probably $80 chucks for these small ones, as opposed to the ball bearing super chucks represented by this sample, and that, that's their premium model. Well, Albrecht, they have a keyless type too. But this helps you to get the drill bit a little bit tighter because there's ball bearings in there that reduce the friction. But those are really expensive chucks, and I'm not going to talk about those. I'm going to talk about the plain chucks, the plain bearing chucks. Now, I happen to have four of these smaller ones here, which are 5 16ths capacity, but they're built the same as the bigger ones, so I'm going to sacrifice one of these for the good of the cause. Now, when you buy Jacob's chucks, they are available with uh, threads of different sizes and with a taper in here, different size tapers, to mount them on Morse taper or other type of arbors. Jacobs always stamped the chuck number and the capacity and their name and uh, where it's made right on the body of the chuck. So if you should ever need to order repair parts, be sure and refer to that. But you're going to find that the repair parts in a box like this are almost as expensive as a new chuck itself. And then you got all the work of installing them. But it's interesting to see how they're made. Let's get on with it. When you buy a chuck, it'll always come with a chuck key of the correct size. So if you need to replace the key, make sure you get the exact right one because some of them appear to fit but in fact do not and they don't engage correctly and sometimes they have the wrong size pilot and try to get a genuine Jacobs quite often or all the time I think they have the number right here on the thumb piece that's a number seven and no I was wrong they don't all have it some of them are stamped on uh, the body here or on the shank and that's a number 30 so ref take your chuck or your old key to, to you uh, with you to the hardware store and often they sell replacement chuck keys. Years ago I recall them calling these chucks geared chucks because in fact there's a set of bevel gears here. This is one of the gears and then the other one built onto the, the chuck sleeve. And that's what allows you to have the mechanical advantage and leverage that you need to tighten that uh, drill bit down so you don't have a drill bit that slips and then damages the shank on the drill bit. Now I took the liberty, as it is my want to do, to make a cutaway. You know, I like my cutaways. So since this is all hardened, I did take it apart and you have to press it apart. And then using a Dremel, I cut this apart as hardened steel so that you can see some of the inner workings. Also, I put it on the milling machine and using a carbide cutter, I made a slot here so you can at least see how one of the jaws is moving. Now watch this. These uh, thread teeth here are on the red jaw and each jaw has uh, has teeth on it and they're not all the same it's a set and uh, you must install them in the correct spot and in the correct sequence like you do with the three jaw chuck on a lathe 
But as I turn this, and notice that it's wide open now, and when it's wide open, the end of the jaw strikes the uh, body of the chuck right here, and that's, that's the stop. Now as I turn it, the jaws close like you saw when I had it on the lathe a few minutes. And right here, this part here, is the split nut. That is a nut, like this. This is a different size one, of course, but it's, it's a nut and they come in uh, two pieces like this. It's a set, but they are machined as one and then broken into two and shipped that way with the set. And it says on the box, broken in halves to be used in sets only, so that people uh, do not assume that that got broken shipping or, or they were sent defective parts. So that's the nut, the two-piece nut. Now watch the red jaw through the slot here, and you can see the teeth as I open it up. And the jaw teeth will start appearing right there. And just the opposite. When you tighten it, goes the other way until the jaws come together. Now I mark these jaws. The red one goes into the visible slot here, and then I put little marks on the other ones. I ground little marks. There's a, a one on that corresponding with. Now you won't do that. I did that for teaching aid purposes here. Otherwise, you have to lay the jaws out and look at this pathetic little drawing that Jacobs provided telling you how to uh, identify which jaws are, uh, and they're numbered one, two, three. That's all the instructions that they gave, but of course this is 40 years old and this is really pathetic. You, you learn more by looking at YouTube videos, and many people have done a video on how to replace the jaws, but I decided to do one too. In order to take a chuck apart, you need to use a press, an arbor press or a hydraulic press, and you probably need to make some little uh, gizmos or gadgets to allow you to press it. Do not press against the jaws themselves. Sometimes you're taking these apart simply to clean them, not to replace the parts. So, uh, since I have cut this apart, that has relieved some of the tension, and this is very easy for me to get apart just by tapping it with a brass hammer. You're not going to get it apart that easily on one of these. You will have to press it. You also probably can use a heavy-duty vise for that, but very quickly here I can knock the sleeve off. And that'll come off, I think like that. Now right away the nut will fall off, that split nut. And the threads on the split nut are machined in there at an angle because the jaws are at an angle. You see that? Notice also on the split nut that there's a, a bit of a chamfer on one side. The chamfers have to match up. For instance, they will not work this way. It just won't go in, and that uh, chamfer should be down toward the jaw end of the chuck, the open end. Now if I take both of the nut halves off, then very easily the jaws will pull out. Here's a, an original patent drawing taken off of Google Patents from 1962, and there's the patent number. I'll put a copy of this at the end of the video so you can examine that if you're in the mood. But it tells you the general construction of this uh, type of chuck. But this Mr. Stoner was, a, a, was a given the patent, but the patent was assigned to 
uh, Jacob's company. I'm sure this is a Jacob's. It doesn't say that on here, but I'm just deducing that. I always think that's interesting to see these old patents. And there's really quite a few different patents. This one's from 1925. I'm not sure if that is uh, Jacob's or not. Because the Jacob's chucks go way, way back. In review, this is called the sleeve. You already saw the jaws and the nut. And this is the main body. But notice how intricate and accurately this must be made. And that the holes for the jaws, needless to say, are at an angle. That's what allows the, the jaws to come together around the drill bit and grip it. And this is one size over quarter inch, but jaws are going to vary depending on the size and capacity of the chuck. When you take a close-up look at the end of the threads on the jaws, you're going to see now why I told you they are not the same and have to be put in in sequence. Look right here to see where the thread actually starts on the jaw. To reassemble the chuck, you would take jaw one, insert it like that. I like to put them all the way to the end. Jaw two. And they have to be rotated so that they're in, their, in the correct orientation. And number three. And they should be cleaned, of course, and oiled on assembly. Then the two-piece nut is fitted into place, and that might require some uh, fiddling around and, uh, and fussing with it to get that in the exact right position, and make sure all of your jaws are in there in the correct orientation and not rotated slightly within the hole. I put a wire tie around the nut. Now that isn't necessary for assembly. I just did that so it won't fall apart as I talk about it and, and uh, work it a little bit. But the whole assembly there now isn't really any different than a nut and a bolt other than it's at an angle and the nut is split. But the principle is the same. Now with the wire tire tie holding it together I see I'm turning the nut now and and that's no different than turning the shell. Remember you saw this on YouTube first. This is a YouTube first. And somebody always tells me, nah, about 20 other guys have done that already. Now, if you don't have the assembly corrector, you might have one jaw sticking out farther than the other, the same as you would on a three-jaw chuck on a lathe. That's why I said to get all the jaws down against this shoulder here. Okay, with the wire tie removed, we can take the uh, sleeve. I call that the shell. It's, a, it's the sleeve, correctly. And you got to be careful that that nut does not separate. So if you hold it straight up and down, it's a little bit easier to get this on. Now you're going to have to press yours. That drove right on again because this has opened up a little bit because the stresses have been relieved and you press it together as far as it will go and then there is a, a shoulder right here and it won't go any farther than that. That's what puts it in the correct position here 
in regards to the amount that is uh, remaining right here. Oh, that one's so rusty you can't tell. And there it is, ladies and gentlemen. That is how a Jacob's Plain Bearing Chuck works. Hope you enjoyed this. Tell your friends. Hope you liked it. This is Tubal Cain saying so long, and I'll see you in my next video.